Welcome everyone. It is a pleasure to be here uh, with you today. Thank you. Uh, I see people from all over the world, uh, some familiar faces, some others that are joining for the first time. Welcome to the second webinar uh, of the uh, Applied Evolutionary Epistemology Lab at the University of Lisbon. Um, and uh, uh, we have um, three, uh, uh, three presentations today. Uh, and uh, I'll start with a little bit before uh, doing the, the, the official presentations of the speakers. I'm going to start with a little bit of housekeeping. Um, so uh, the, first, uh, the first thing is that we are going to reserve the questions for the end of the talks, um, just to not interrupt the flow of the, of the presentation itself. Um, we are looking at about uh, 20, 30 minutes of presentation and then 10 minutes, about 10 minutes of questions. Um, another thing that I want to stress is, th is that we are not going to be able to save the chats. Uh, so if uh, you can do that yourself, you can, you can save the chat just going on the, on the, on the chat, uh, on the chat uh, box and going on the bottom close to five, there are three dots. And if you click there, you can save the chat yourself in case there is some important communication that you want to save. Um, so just be aware of that, that the chat is, 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 uh, is gonna be shared. And so um, if there is any information that you think is private, don't share it in the chat box, okay? Um, and uh, finally, I ask you to put the uh, microphone off uh, to avoid interruptions. Um, and um, with that, I want to thank you again, and I'm going to pass it to Natalie that is gonna introduce uh, the speakers and is gonna introduce uh, Thomas uh, as well that is gonna talk a little bit about the, uh, um, the, um, the number uh, in, the, in the journal for the general philosophy uh, of science that was dedicated to evolutionary epistemology. Thank you so much, everyone. Thank you very much, Antonio, and a very warm welcome to everybody. Welcome to the Second Appeal uh, Seminar. And in fact, it is good morning, good afternoon, and good evening uh, for everybody. And so this uh, session is uh, dedicated to a special issue that we have been doing on evolutionary epistemology. And we, that is Michael Brady and I, Michael, who is also here, we have been uh, for the past uh, two years now editing a special issue on evolutionary epistemology for the Journal for General Philosophy of Science. And uh, Thomas Radon, uh, he is uh, one of the editors in chief of the journal together with Helmut Putte and Klaus uh, Beisbart, and I think also recently Basia Galupi. Um, and uh, Thomas is uh, here also to say a bit about the journal. And um, first of all, we want to, uh, both Michael and I, we want to thank Thomas very kindly for uh, hosting our special issue. And uh, um, for those of you who don't know Thomas, uh, shame on you, because Thomas is a very uh, uh, important uh, philosopher of science who is uh, associated with the Leibniz House in uh, Hanover and also uh, with the, you know, the, the Michigan State University. And so Thomas, uh, please, I would like to give you the floor. Yeah, thank you very much. So th thank you for, for inviting me here. Um, I'm really a little bit of the, the odd man out here because I don't actually work on evolutionary epistemology myself. I do work on applications of evolutionary theory outside of the biological sciences. And I've got a research project on that. But I'm actually here, as Natalie already said, as one of the three editors in chief of the Journal for General Philosophy of Science. So together with indeed Helmut Pulte and Guido Bacciagalupi. So Guido recently replaced Klaus Beispart as the third editor-in-chief. Um, and um, I guess what I can say about the journal is that it is, it is what its name says it is. It is a journal for general philosophy of science and also for specialized philosophies of science. So we, we publish very broadly in the various philosophies of the special sciences, and we also try to have very general discussions on philosophy of science more broadly, which perhaps are a little bit less represented in other more specialized journals in that respect. Um, indeed, as Natalie also already said, um, we do several special issues. And one of these is the special issue on evolutionary epistemology that has been going on now for indeed about two years, I think, which is quite a bit of time, but we're nearing its completion now. And I'm very happy with these special issues because they give us the opportunity to, to highlight 
specific areas of philosophy of science which can be really interesting and perhaps also are a little bit underrepresented. And I think that evolutionary epistemology is one of those areas. So I'm very, very grateful for Natalie and, and to Natalie and to Michael for suggesting this special issue to us. Um, so in order to be able to say a little bit more, I, I looked at one of the more interesting books, I think, um, from the earlier days of evolutionary epistemology, um, edited by Werner Kallebaut and Rick Pinkston, already from 1987, where they start out their volume by asking, well, does evolutionary epistemology actually exist? Is there such a field as evolutionary epistemology? And then they say, well, if you, if you look at it really closely, there's no real paradigm, there's no real set of core problems, there's no real set of solutions. Um, and let me quote from their opening paper there. Um, they're saying, on closer inspection, one gets the feeling that on the whole, little has been accomplished to date in terms of dependable theory or relevant application. And I do think that since then, a lot has been going on in evolutionary epistemology that hasn't actually been called evolutionary epistemology. So there's been a lot of discussions on things like agency and uh, cultural evolution and things like that, which haven't actually been called evolutionary epistemology. And this is why I'm so happy with this special issue because it brings together things that are major themes in the philosophy of biology, which have not been flagged out as being part of the tradition of evolutionary epistemology. And this special issue sort of brings it together and flags it out as this is what the, the area is, or this is what, is what the field is, has been talking about for the past decades. So I'm really happy to have this special issue. I'm also really happy to see all the different topics that have been brought together in the special issue. And I'm also happy to be able to say that we're very close to completing it. So. The issue as it looks uh, like now will consist of nine papers in total, plus an introduction by uh, Natalie and Michael. Um, we're still waiting for the last paper. So the issue as such as an issue of a journal doesn't exist yet, but eight out of nine papers already are available online as online first, so they're readily accessible. Um, once the last paper um, has been finalized, we will be assembling the special issue. I'm not at this moment sure which number uh, it will be uh, this year. I'm pretty sure it will appear this year, but it might be later this year. So it might be um, issue number three or issue number four of our journal of this year. But we'll have the journal or the, the issue finalized um, pretty soon, I think. Um, apart from that, um, I can only say I'm looking forward to the talks. This is my first time participating in this setting. So I'm really eager to see what the discussion will be like and um, what the presentations will be like. So thanks again for having me here. Thank you very much, Thomas. And Michael, do you want to also say something about the issue or? Michael, Michael, no? No. Okay. Okay. So uh, we, we have uh, three papers that we are highlighting from the special issue. And so the first one is uh, written by Raymond and by Dennis Noble. And so um, uh, it was also actually when, uh, when um, we were at CLMPS Day in Prague, I think that it was, yes. And um, both Thomas, uh, Radon and me were in the audience when we heard uh, Dennis Noble talk uh, in a special uh, session on uh, Karl Popper who was also very important in evolutionary epistemology. And so they gave me the idea at the time to invite Dennis uh, to, to uh, uh, write his paper for the special issue. And then he invited his brother, uh, Raymond Noble. And so um, I'm very happy with the both of you. It, it was a very uh, nice paper that you contributed to the special issue. And so uh, Raymond Noble is a, a, a scholar who has a background in zoology, neurology, ethics, and physiology. And then Dennis Noble um, uh, also has a background in physiology. And he has uh, worked a lot on the physiology of the heart. But in recent years, he's also uh, very active in uh, uh, the third way of evolution, which is uh, an initiative that he uh, organizes together with uh, James Shapiro and with Raji Pukotil and uh, many other uh, evolutionary scholars. And so um, I'm very happy um, uh, that they wrote this paper. And uh, both Dennis and Ray have um, uh, made an, uh, a video of their presentation. And so we're first going to scream, 
uh, sorry, we're first going to show the video and then um, questions are going to be later. So let me try to um, share that video. Sorry, there's no volume. Sometimes that's a Zoom setting also that you have to go in and allow that uh, Zoom captures whatever is playing on your computer. Let me know if the problem is solved, please. Uh, we can hear something, but it's very, very far. Can you put the volume up eventually? So um, somebody said that I have to go for another uh, setting then. Which, yes, which one? It's a it? Zoom setting, and it should be on the bottom of the bar. That, uh, yeah, and it has to do. Uh, maybe, no, I don't see it there. But uh, you have to. Maybe go into your top settings in the upper left hand corner um, where it has the um, audio automatically playing um, being picked up by Zoom because it's automatic is not to do that. So that if you're, you know, uh, doing some, you know, multitasking that it won't play. Did Manchester in um, the no. 70s and then did a PhD yes. in neuroscience at Manchester. the university. Yeah. Put it from the beginning, it's perfect. Thank you. Hello, um, I'm Raymond Noble. I'm a biologist. I studied zoology at the University of Manchester in 1970s and then did a PhD in neuroscience at the University of Edinburgh, where I studied somatosensory systems in mammals. Um, I later took a post at University College London, where I continued to be a physiologist and to teach physiology. Uh, but I also became an ethicist and have a great interest in um, causality in biological systems, and in particular, how it applies to the concepts of agency, how we become agents, and what it is that determines the level of agency that we have. And I'm Dennis Noble, and I happen also to be the brother of Raymond Noble. Um, but we, we've, as it were, come at all of this from slightly different angles, because I also trained as a physiologist at University College London, but not at the time that he became uh, an, an academic there. Uh, I was a student there. And what I did in the early stages of my career was to encounter a form of downward causation in the way in which the rhythm of the heart is generated because it is actually a downward causation from the cell itself onto the proteins that uh, enable the rhythm to occur. Anyway, that means that for a long time, I've also been interested in the way in which higher levels in biological systems influence and even control uh, the lower levels. So with that, we will go straight into our presentation. Thank you very much. So our presentation is entitled Reasons and Agency um, and was published as an article in the Journal of the General Philosophy of Science uh, just last year in 2020. And our proposal in that paper is that the process of harnessing, that is using stochasticity, chance, could be the basis of resolving a long-standing philosophical problem. And that problem is the tension between what are thought to be standard empirical, usually mechanistic scientific accounts of organism behavior and views of life that regard behavior as the outcome of rational and value-driven decisions. So what then is the nature of the problem? 
Deterministic accounts of behavior tend to rule out the concept of free agency, regarding it even as an illusion. We argue that this is a profound misunderstanding of how biological systems function. Because all life is, in fact, a creative process. It, life doesn't just simply hold itself constant or even between given variables, but it does need to maintain its integrity, which isn't quite the same thing as holding things constant. In fact, all around it, life experiences change. And in response to that change, it must change itself. So um, it isn't, therefore, a mechanical system that's closed. So what is this reductionist view then? That all action in biological systems can be understood entirely by observing molecular processes involved. So that function at a systems level arises solely out of this molecular interaction. This reductionist view holds then that essentially life can be reduced to biochemistry. And this is particularly true of the gene-centric view, which presents genes as primary causal entities. We see this as it, as it um, invades our language and the way we talk about genes. Genes for this or genes for that. Genes as a code. Genes as a blueprint. And we even find that there is talk of genes as if we were their prisoners and not ourselves in control. This reductionist view stems from two false assumptions about biological systems, that they are, first of all, closed systems, and secondly, that they are mechanistic. Indeed, biological systems are not closed. They are open at all levels. So the what is happening at the molecular level is influenced and under constraints and control by what is happening at the cellular level. And cells also are interactive and are influencing each other at the tissue level. And the tissues are influenced by what's happening at the organ level and the organ at the organism level. And also organisms are interacting with other organisms. They interact within the ecosystem and also at the psychosocial level, they interact with other members of the same species and even with other members of other species at a social level. And this is open at all levels. There is an, both an exchange of information, an exchange of, of um, material between all these layers. Uh, so we're not dealing with a closed mechanical system. Um, so, and there cannot be closure at any of these levels. Life would not be able to exist if it were a closed system. But causality is not a linear sequence either. It's not that A causes B causes C causes D that ultimately leads to any particular kind of output or behavior. Caus causality can also be conditional. And an awful lot of the interaction between the levels of organization is conditional and constraining. So it is certainly not mechanistic. It's not like looking at cogs and wheels and pulleys and levers and so on. Albeit we might have levers within our system. We've got arms and legs and so on. And we can see that these can be understood in terms of levers. But this is not all we are. The causes from the different levels, between the different levels, mesh. And the causal nature of them is that they're not confined with any one level. Boundaries between organizational levels are not fixed boundaries. They're not barriers. They are functional in nature. You can see this in the cell and the cell membrane. The cell membrane is one of the most functional um, organelles of the cell. It is, after all, functional 
the functionality of the membrane that enables it to interact with other cells. But this is true throughout at all levels. Um, organ systems, for example, interact with each other either through the nervous system or through hormonal systems. So there's not a causal closure at any one of these levels. And that is certainly true at the social level. Um, there is no causal closure and no hard barriers between these um, levels of organization. And when we look at this organization, when we look at the functionality, we find that much of what is happening has an enormous amount of variability, of stochasticity. And this stochasticity is harnessed to produce creative and directed change. Once again, you can see this just at the cellular level. When we look at what's happening with the membrane, and for example, the potential difference that exists between the inside of the cell and the outside of the cell, the electrical potential difference, which is so important in much of its function. This is generated in large part by simply the random movement of ions across the membrane, which is then constrained and controlled by channels operating, by gates, if you like, operating within the membrane. And it's a good example of the way in which life harnesses stochasticity to uh, produce effective and directed change. So look at the nature of this biological stochasticity then. It isn't that we are suggesting that what you do is, as it were, when you come to a choice, you invoke a random number generator to produce chance. That's not how it works. It isn't just added variability, a smidgen of variability added, for example, at synapses in the nervous system. It's there already. It's integral to the system as a whole. It has a role in molecular processes, in the DNA, for example, one of the things that's happening in the DNA is a continuous process of random change, which in fact the system has to control and contain, else it would eventually destroy the system. In neuronal processes we see it, we see it at synapses, bubbling with chemicals that it's releasing. A lot of this is due to random fluctuations that are occurring that are then controlled by other inhibitory modulatory processes at the synapse, which may allow information to pass through or to pull it back, rein it back. It's a, a wash, if you like, with chemicals that are acting in this kind of stochastic way, but which is then controlled, contained, manipulated, molded to produce function. Life indeed could not exist without this stochasticity. It is controlled by the organism and can be modulated by it. So just take a really lovely example of this. What we see here are identical twins. Now, identical twins won't have exactly the same genome, but it's very close to that. And the particular photographs you see here show on the left a long distance runner, and on the right his twin brother who trained as a weightlifter, and the difference in the muscular and skeletal development of those two twins is very clear. Now, more recently, that was done right back in 1981, but more recently in a publication in 2018, the authors, Bathgate and his collaborators, showed that that difference exists right down at the level of RNAs that are controlling the expression by DNAs. So physiological experiments show that decisions do have micro level consequences. That is hard and already established. Now gene determinists might nevertheless argue the athlete just had the right genes to enable him to be a successful uh, athlete, whether or not 
he uses them. But what these experiments show is that the RNAs that control the DNA and the proteins that then are created, particularly in the case of these um, uh, sportsmen, the proteins that enable their muscles to work well, those only occur, those changes only occur if a decision is made at the psychosocial level. We can see this psychosocial level, not just in human um, organisms, but also in other animal species. Um, our cousins, the chimpanzees, for example, uh, will interact socially, will take decisions socially, will learn socially. And um, one of the things that, uh, one of the um, clear examples of decision making, of intentional activity and behavior is, of course, the use of tools and of sol uh, problem solving. And here we see a problem being solved, which is actually how to get honey from a honey box. And what the chimpanzees are doing here uh, is to use a stick to obtain the honey. Um, other organisms are capable of this kind of agency. Um, the use of tools to gather food, to extract food, for example, nuts, or in this case, honey. But the important thing to emphasize here too is that this is something that is demonstrable at a cultural level. Many of these behaviors, many of these ways of solving problems had to be, as it were, introduced into the group, either by one member of the group or a group of them solving a problem together, um, because they're not present in all groups. All groups will approach problems somewhat differently. Chimpanzees and bonobos and so on will use signs to communicate with each other, facial expressions, sounds, body language, and so on, in a constant communication about what it is they intend to do. And one chimpanzee will be anticipating the behavior of the other, reading, as it were, these signs so that they can cooperate in their behavior. This is another example here with a chimpanzee using a stone and an anvil to crack a nut. And the chimpanzees don't just simply use any old stone. They will choose an appropriate stone. And when they find a stone that is most suitable for cracking nuts, and they also may decide to hone that stone, make it even more suitable, they will treasure that stone and try to keep it for another occasion. Sometimes they will allow other chimpanzees to use the stone, but sometimes they rather secrete it away so that they can know where it is for a future occasion. It is anticipatory of solving problems in the same way at a future time. Chimpanzees are not the only uh, animals to use the stones to crack a nut, and here is a monkey. And this one is using what one might regard as a sledgehammer to crack a nut. But the same principle is there. And I have to stress again that these are decisions being made at a cultural level. Very often it has to be introduced uh, to the, the group. Such cultural differences in behavior are often observed in many different species. It's often observed in some species of bird too. And uh, so it's not an unusual thing, particularly in um, animals that uh, require social cooperation uh, in behavior. So it's not a question of whether reasons influence agency but how it does so. We can be aware of our reasons also, and this awareness itself becomes part of the process of reasoning. So even if those who choose to regard this process as an illusion, would I think have to consider whether or not we are using this illusion itself in the process of reasoning, and that we anticipate that others have this illusion 
illusion as well. And we take that into account in our reasoning and our social interaction. So whatever one calls it, whether you want to call it agency, whether you want to call it will, whether you want to call it self-awareness or whatever you wish to call it, simply trying to dismiss it as an illusion doesn't really get at the process. Reasoning is a process. And it's not instantiated in a particular material state at a particular time. It's an ongoing interactive process, both with the environment and with others. We've said that openness occurs at all levels. And there's certainly an increasing level of openness, of exchange and freedom, as it like, if you like, for other influences to occur in the function as we go up through the hierarchy, if that's the right way of talking about it, which we don't really think it is, um, of levels of functionality. Perhaps the greatest kind of closure occurs further down at the molecular level, but it, it's still an open system. What is happening at the sociotype level and the ecotype level acts through the phenotype, down through the system, to even modulate and regulate and change the DNA over generations. So this kind of harnessing of stochasticity to bring about directed change can also operate at the evolutionary level. So the resolution of the problem lies in showing how organisms indeed are creative. This is a definition of life. All problem, all life is problem creating and solving. The problem is the solution. So it is the harnessing, not just the experiencing of stochasticity that enables creative agency. Life itself is naturally the solution to the problem. So the harnessing of stochasticity in guided responses to environmental challenges is what achieves what blind chance alone could not possibly do. And all physiological systems do this, even as we've shown at the genetic level, and it certainly does so in systems like the immune system. We can reason at a social level and we can communicate our reasoning and turn this reasoning influence into the choice processes we make, which then influence all the lower levels of the organism. Thus, reason becomes cause. Reasons can't exist without the life forms that create and use them. Social interactions, language, are the ways in which we store and pass on to future generations. This, of course, is cultural inheritance. So thank you very much for inviting us. We're open to your discussion. Thank you very much, Dennis and uh, Raymond. Oh, what is this? What's happening? I don't know what that was. Okay, questions? I'll be asking questions now or later, it's Predrag. Now, now we have we have a couple of uh, minutes for questions, and then after the results, there are also going to be breakout rooms. But we have a uh, uh, time for a couple of questions. Do you have one? Can I ask a question? Yeah. Yes. Um, excellent, um, excellent talk. I like it very much. But I was wondering whether you considered um, the previous schools of thought similar to what you're saying. And these are uh, basically Maturana and Varela, autopoiesis, and Robert Rosen, anticipatory systems. What you're saying is very similar to these two schools. So do you have any comments on that? I just come in quickly first. I have great admiration uh, for Maturana and Varela uh, and, and for both the schools you're referring to. You're quite right. and. Um, we, we attempt to acknowledge a reasonable number of the predecessors. We end up with very long reference lists, but this is a good opportunity to say, yes, of course, they were on to the same kind of thing. And I like in particular 
the term autopoiesis, we're not little thermostats. We, we are, um, it is autoresis, if you want to call it that. Yeah. And that, of course, also comes from uh, those particular pioneers. Indeed, yes, I, it, sorry, if I could just add to that, um, the, in fact, it was, I remember what, a sort of a eureka moment when Dennis and I were talking about um, autopoiesis and so on. And we, I, I remember sort of saying to him, you know, look, these people have done this. This is a wonderful thing. So, yes, I mean, you know, we, we, we stand on some really sound uh, um, shoulders. I think that the anticipatory thing is a, is a key element of it. That anticipation of the other and the other's anticipation as an iterative and interactive uh, social engagement, which you can see across species, uh, it is a significant part of what is going on. And then, of course, the way in which the or organisms will bond through, through that kind of anticipation, the sharing, if you like, of a conceptual framework within which they're operating, I think is, is extremely significant. Um, I, 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 I'm reluctant to sort of say communal thought, mm. but there's certainly uh, some kind of ongoing um, framework within which organisms appear to operate. Um, and it even occurs across species. We, we, we've been fascinated to see the way in which um, organisms, different species, can sometimes cooperate with each other in obtaining food. One recently that we've been looking at is a, a fish cooperating with an octopus. And there's an a, a extraordinary dialogue, if you like, that goes on uh, between the two organisms. Uh, two completely different species that will um, lead to their cooperative behavior and stress again that it is cooperative behavior and it frees ourselves from this notion that somehow or other our behavioral paradigms are sort of gene centrically determined. We don't switch genes from being on the one hand sometimes rather selfish and, and self-interested to the other occasions when we're sharing things and we're giving things. We don't suddenly change our genome. What we do of course is to interact in a different kind of way. We uh, promote certain kinds of behavior which um, then within the group influences others in the group. So it's another example, and this time at a social level, of niche creation, because it's that social, that psychosocial niche, which I, I, I firmly believe, and Dennis does too, then influences even our evolutionary process, because we are selecting, we are the environment. There's no separation between organism and environment. They are intimately interactive and uh, creating the very thing that the neo-Darwinists would regard as a passive process, but it clearly is an active process because it's being actively created. And that creation involves an enormous degree of selectivity of who we have as our partners, who we cooperate with, how we cooperate and so on. And controlling the way organisms control um, cooperate within a, a group, punishing, if you like, some that don't cooperate, yeah. facilitating others that do. You know, so this idea that somehow or other we're driven by some sort of mutual, simply mutual self-interest. Of course, you'll see, if you decide that the measure of success in organisms is the number of genes that are held in a gene pool, where the hell is this gene pool? It's in the organisms. It doesn't exist out there. It cannot be an objective that is external to the organisms. You have to preserve the organisms to preserve the genome. So it's, it's, it's a chicken and egg kind of uh, question. Sorry, I said a long-winded answer to your question, but yes, we are heavily influenced no, by, those, by those ideas. Excellent. I'll just uh, to say at the end, uh, Robert Rosen actually developed mathematics behind autopoiesis. So it's, and he called organisms anticipatory systems. So it's that perhaps including some of those in your lines of thinking. Thank you. We have time for one more question. I think, Paolo, you had a question, right? Paolo Abrantes? You're uh, muted. You have to unmute yourself. You have to unmute yourself. Paolo. Yes, okay. my mic, it's OK. Thank you very much for, for the very interesting talk. Uh, even uh, though your, your presentation was not evolutionary, in orientation, 
But uh, well, we, what you have just said uh, links uh, your talk to the to evolutionary issues. I would like to 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 ask you if you see a connection and tr between your view and the development of system theory, or it's a kind of evil devil, uh, but it's more radical than that. If you see any connection between that. It's a view that uh, questions the, the, the central role that genes have in development and in evolution. The quick answer to what you're raising, I think, is that Charles Darwin himself actually identified first the role of social selection, that was his theory of sexual selection, um, and showed that it has evolutionary consequences. Uh, because the, this was the big rift that then developed because uh, Wallace disagreed with him and said, no, no, sexual selection is also simply natural selection, a passive process. Julian Huxley, when he wrote the modern synthesis, totally agreed with him. And that, I think, was the big mistake in evolutionary biology. Darwin was there. He got it right. And it was later that people removed this role of agency from the evolutionary process. It gets even more severe, of course, when you take into account the agency of organisms in actually changing their genomes. This, of course, is the genome reorganization that can occur and has been demonstrated ever since Barbara McClintock worked on uh, corn and its rearrangement of the DNA under stress uh, way back in the 1940s. So it's a great question. I don't know whether I've exactly answered what you were getting at. Okay. Um, is there time for, I, I saw Dick, uh, where you, do you have a final question? Maybe the last one. Yes, Just go simply, ahead. Uh, thank you. Uh, simply, I agree with everything that uh, Noble and Noble propose, totally, but I'm still left wondering why I have the distinct impression that the great majority of biologists, including evolutionary biologists, are still resistant to this idea of agency uh, and or whatever you want to call it, autopoiesis or anything, the top down you know, effects uh, on the process of evolution and on the processes of life, which is what we're really talking about is the living process. Why are people still so resistant to this uh, view of being part of biology and part of evolutionary biology in particular? Well, can I just start? I will add that to Ray because I will otherwise bang the table and get very angry. You'll get very <laughs> angry. You'll get very angry because it, it's, it's, it's more than they're not um, accepting agency. It's one of the reasons why they'd rather they'd rather regard agency and free will and all this kind of thing as being illusory, simply because they, for their model itself, it has not to exist, else it would interfere with their model. It can't yeah. exist. That's that's the problem. And their model has become so dogmatic that for decades it has held biology in a vice. Yes. So that people operating within biology, even those of us who knew and could see that this is the case. Well, I refer to the fact earlier that I was a zoology student in the 1970s, and I was beginning to receive this nonsense, this dogmatic nonsense, that all you needed to do to understand behavior was to somehow or other treat it as algorithmic. And, uh, you know, I, I used to do studies, you know, we used to do these projects where you, you study birds and they fly down, you, you put, you hide food away and then you watch their behavior as they uh, search for the food and they come down and they, they peck, 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 peck and turn a given angle and you measure that angle and it goes peck, 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 peck. And then they turn another angle and they go on again and peck, 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 hop, 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 peck, 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 hop, 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 peck, peck, peck. And you can produce a mathematics of this. Of course you can. Of course you can. And you can find that on average, they will peck so many times before they hop, hop, hop and turn an angle of a particular degree before they hop, hop, hop and peck again and so on. Of course you can describe this mathematically, but where's the agency in that? There's none. What they're wanting to do, of course, is to say that, that 
agency doesn't interfere with this. I can see something, I can taste it, I can feel it, sense it, see it, hear it. But the one thing they don't want me to do is to be aware of the fact that I'm aware of it. And that seems to me to be utterly absurd. And yet that dogma has held uh, a vice-like grip on, uh, on, on biologists uh, for decades now. The idea that genes have to be central to our behavior such that the characteristics of our behavior are determined by it and that our action can be described as selfish. Why? Because it maintains genes in the genome. And it, it, it's as simplistic as that. If you count genes, you'll find that genes are kept in the genome. But the point of evolution, evolution won't happen unless genes change. So the task is not to hold genes in a genome. The task is to bring about functional change in genomes and in phenotypes that enable survival in the light of the fact that our environment is continually changing, which is where we started from, you know, that, that, that organisms change because they, the, the environment changes, the organism changes, the environment changes, the organism changes, the environment changes, the organism changes, the environment changes. The integrity of the whole thing is maintained as an ecosystem. And that's the important thing. Blinding ourselves to that leaves us not to understand the important and crucial decisions that we make as agents about our environment. I don't know that it answers the question why, other than the fact that it's be it became a dogma. And it was difficult for scientists to operate outside the dogma because we know that science unfortunately relies on funding. And if you, honestly, if you tried to get funding that looked at anything other than genetic deterministic views of how things operated, even in medicine, uh, you, you'd be barking up the wrong tree. The secrets were gonna be there. This is the secret of life. I found the secret of life, they said back in the 1950s. And there, all, all we had to do is understand the secret. No <laughs> secret. There's no secret. The only real secret is what goes on between us and when we don't talk about it. That's secret sometimes. Our loves, our hates, our desires, our feelings. Of course they are. But then we don't want to deal with those because we can't get at them materially. And, you know, as if, but then we say something ridiculous, which is because we can't get at them materially, they don't exist which is rather absurd because we're all acting on the basis of them. I've said enough and my dog has come to remind me that I've said enough. I, I think this Thank is, is a, a good start for, for uh, the breakout room later for the, the talk later. I see also, Chris, that you have a, a question, but I, I would uh, like to ask you to, to take it to the breakout room, room later because we have to move on to Antonio's talk. I want to thank very much uh, Dennis and Raymond for this uh, very interesting talk and also this lively discussion. And I hope that we can uh, discuss this more later. So uh, let's move forward to uh, Antonio Fada. Uh, please, I think Antonio also has like a video, so please, uh, uh, Start a preparation for that already. And so Antonio Fada is a, a, a student of philosophy and he got his master at the Sapienza University in Italy. And then he went on to British Columbia in Canada where he did another master in interdisciplinary studies. And Antonio is a very capable uh, philosopher of science and interdisciplinary scholar. And he uh, wrote a, a chapter well, a, a, um, a paper for this special issue also on the evolution of culture. And so he's going to be talking about that. And Antonio is also the one who has been uh, facilitating with me these uh, uh, webinar series. So thank you very much for that as well. So Antonio, please. Thank you so much. I'm gonna, I'm gonna start sharing. Um. Just obviously to go. Going to the beginning. Bear with me. Uh, do you guys can see the, the screen? Yes. Perfect. Thanks so much. Thanks everyone, and it is a great pleasure for me to be uh, here today presenting, doing my presentation. And uh, the title of my presentation is Towards a Populationist Account of Scientific Evolution. And 
in uh, in this presentation, I have re-elaborated a little bit uh, some material that I uh, presented on my uh, recent article uh, titled "Population Thinking in Epistemic Evolution," um, published in the Journal for General Philosophy of Science. Uh, the first important distinction that I that I addressed in my paper is that between an EM program and an EET program. This uh, distinction has been introduced by Michael Brady uh, and is uh, still very relevant and fundamental to understand um, how we can apply cultural evolution to um, epistemic evolution. So EM stands for Evolution of Epistemological Mechanisms. Uh, it, has, it is an orientation that has been championed uh, in the philosophy of science by Michael Bruce. He is more interested to look at um, the cognitive dispositions that are hardwired in our brains and that constrain and, and generate you know, epistemic decisions and ultimately uh, um, scientific progress. Um, the other um, approach is the EET approach, Evolutionary Epistemology of Theories, and it has been advanced by David Hall um, between others, and this approach is more historical. It looks at change over time. Um, it looks at conceptual replicators, how ideas, scientific ideas progress over time, and it looks at scientific communities. Scientists are the primary interactors uh, that generate these um, evolutionary change, exchanging their ideas. Um, so two very different uh, approach in a way. Uh, Michael Roos, for instance, has criticized the EET program, saying that they are uh, the present day cultural evolutionary theory is not well developed, uh, uh, is not developed enough to basically make a fruitful use of, of this theory in the context of, of the philosophy of science. Um, I, I disagree with that. And um, um, I will try to present the reasons why it is a in the rest of the presentation. So uh, the first thing to note is that this important institution that we've just mentioned is very close to uh, another distinction present in cultural evolution uh, and another debate actually is the debate between evolutionary psychologists on one side and cultural evolutionists on the other. So evolutionary psychologists think that culture is ultimately um, a not um, fundamental evolutionary and adaptive process. So what they think is that um, an evolutionary approach should rather look at um, cognitive adaptations that are hardwired in our brain and that they have been obviously developed over evolutionary time. Um, they uh, mention and they talk uh, uh, about culture as an evolved process and they use the metaphor of, of the two boxes. Um, for instance, they say that humans are like two boxes that have a repertoire of songs within them and they um, um, play different songs and different musics um, responding to a um, parameter like the uh, their location, the parameter of location. If this two box, if we can think of these two boxes located in different parts of the world, we will see that they play different type of music. But ultimately, what is important is to study the repertoire uh, that is contained, these are wired in the two, bo two boxes. Um, so that's why they, you know, in a way, they don't play the importance of cultural evolution. Um, and this is similar to what the EEM uh, model does in a way. Uh, on the other side, uh, cultural uh, evolutionary theory thinks that um, social learning is an adaptation in itself that has created um, that has created uh, the ability to accumulate uh, culture and to accumulate cultural adaptations. And these adaptations uh, go far beyond the hardwired disposition in our species. So cultural, cultural adaptations cannot be evoked. Uh, one of their examples is uh, the example of uh, um, a group of European um, explorers that tried to cross uh, the Australian desert back in the 18th century. And they, uh, they, they, were, um, they were 
almost died. They were they were almost died until they were rescued by the indigenous people. And uh, Cultural Revolutionists use this as an example to explain that well, those um, explorers they could not certainly evoke the very complex uh, and well adapted cultural um, um, practices of the indigenous people that allow them to survive in that uh, environment. So culture is adaptive, is an adaptation, and is an adaptation that uh, uh, goes far beyond uh, what uh, can be evoked uh, through our hardwired dispositions. And obviously it's uh, cumulative and it's adaptive. And here is an example of the similarities between cultural evolutionary theory and uh, evolutionary epistemological theories. Uh, we have a definition here of Mazzuli. He's talking about you know, social transmission and social learning that allows knowledge, the accumulation of knowledge, beliefs, attitudes, norm, preferences, and skills. On the other side, Hall talks about you know, beliefs, uh, goals of science, proper ways to go about realizing these goals, problems and their possible solutions, modes of representation, accumulated data, and so on. So there is a strict correspondence between these definitions. At this point, I want to uh, discuss and uh, introduce the notion of population thinking. It's a very popular notion introduced by Ernest Mayer in, in his famous paper in 1959. Um, where he was trying to describe, describe the, con the great contribution of Darwin uh, to, to biology um, and um, is contrasted with uh, typological thinking, which is another way of, of, of uh, conceiving the, uh, uh, um, the biological process and the evolutionary process. So, um, so just to give a, a very brief definition, population thinking uh, looks at um, changes over time. It's a, an historical approach. Uh, it looks at uh, variants, they change over time, the frequencies of which changes over time within a population of variants. Um, it's not a sudden change, but it's a rather gradual process. Variation is also key, is a key concept and is omnipresent and can be studied at different hierarchical levels from the, the, the level of the variant to the individual level to the group level. Given these premises and given that populationism has been taken to be the core concept of cultural evolution by the American school of uh, cultural evolutionists that refers to Richardson and Boyd, um, my question became, uh, before writing the paper, became how can we apply population thinking to scientific evolution? So here is uh, the definition of, again of typological thinking given by me here. Um, it is important to reflect on, on this to distinction between typological thinking and, and population thinking uh, and to compare it to the um, very influential um, philosophies of science uh, of the last century. In particular, I do that in my paper um, discussing Kuhn's uh, and Hopper um, view of science. Um, and uh, going back to the definition, um, Mayer says that the typological thinking assumes that there is no gradation between types. Gradual evolution is basically a logical impossibility for the typologist. Evolution, if occurs, has to proceed in steps or jumps. And this makes me think that uh, the, uh, uh, like I said before, the influential philosophies of Kuhn and Popper, they were rather typological in their characterization. If we think to the you know, paradigmatic revolutions of Kuhn, um, to this concept of incommensurability. There is this idea that we progress from uh, one theory or one paradigm to the other, and, and there's quite a lot of, uh, of, uh, of uh, separation between the theory and the concept of incommensurability. For instance, um, Popper with this concept of falsification, obviously, um, and his conception also of truth approximation. So it is a conception that they are strictly um, 
very much typological in their characterizations. Um, it's like a sort of a progressive, uh, and here is why it's represented as a ladder, right? Because it, there is a sort of progressing conception uh, of, over time. Um, on the other hand, the population thinking um, is a very different um, way to understand progress. So, um, so here's the definition of me. The ultimate conclusion of the population thinker and of the typologist are precisely the opposite. For the typologist, the type is real and the variation and illusion while for the population is the type, the average, is an abstraction and only the variation is real. So we have to look at variation over time, right? And how to tackle uh, this uh, variation, how, how it progresses, how it changes uh, the, the constituents of, of science as a cultural uh, process. So, and this is much closer to the characterization, evolutionary characterizations of uh, Stephen Tolmin and David Hall, obviously. Tolmin, for example, has talked about, uh, about cross sections, you know, like in archaeology, taking different cross sections over time. It allows us to see the progress that has been made between one and the other. And he says clearly that if we do that, we will notice that the, the progress is, is gradual, it's very gradual. Paul has put a lot of emphasis on the sociology of science, the way that um, scientists, you know, create um, scientific deems with the uh, uh, inter uh, citation um, uh, processes, higher frequencies of inter citation, and 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 that's also a way to look at that, a more progressive way uh, to characterize the scientific um, evolution, uh, and also the obviously the um, concept of the epidemiology of ideas, characterization that are closer to the early um, memetic approach. Um, if there is a uh, evolutionary uh, process, uh, most likely there is going to be a selective process. And here I want to consider the selective forces of cultural uh, evolution. So cultural evolution is um, they uh, talk of two main groups of uh, what they call biases, uh, selective biases, um, which are uh, the content biases and the context biases. Content biases are preferences that are based on the content. For instance, uh, we have a preference for fatty, sugary food, and that has a um, obvious consequence in the evolution of cuisine and um, has an impact also in the fast food industry and so on and so forth. Um, the, uh, the other type of biases are context biases. Uh, there are subdivided into groups, uh, model-based biases and frequency uh, dependent biases. <laughs> For example, a model-based bias uh, based on prestige will predict that an individual will uh, copy uh, a prestigious individual, an individual that has status and prestige uh, within this community. So it will copy its, its uh, cultural habits and then it will create uh, a, a, a trend, a fad in the, in, the, in the larger community, making those traits spread. A frequency um, bias based on conformity will predict that uh, in individuals will conform to their majority, right? Um, so now I believe that this model has some value. It can be applied also to the context of science. And in fact, uh, there is a strict parallel to what um, the philosophers of science, science and epistemologists have, um, have studied uh, about science. For instance, um, here uh, I, uh, try to organize uh, the different uh, uh, possible selective factors in the epistemic context. Uh, in particular reference, I, um, here I took it from uh, Tolmin, Stephen Tolmin characterization, uh, uh, who speaks about a spectrum of selective forces going from more internal to more external factors. For instance, internal factors more positive to the content biases 
uh, of cultural evolutions are criteria such as truth, an epistemic norm such as truth, right? Uh, or, so we um, scientists tend to select uh, um, processes that uh, that generate uh, more uh, truthful statements and, 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 and truth, right? Um, they have criteria of validation that has have something to do with uh, criteria is just truth. Um, super empirical virtues can be other criteria, such as, for example, simplicity, the simplicity, the fruitfulness of a theory, the simplicity uh, is often uh, presented as criteria that select for one theory to, uh, compared to the other. Uh, and so on and so forth, going on a spectrum that goes towards more um, external characteristics. Uh, um, for example, um, styles of thought, right? That might have, might involve more uh, sociological component uh, components and, and 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 so on and so forth. Um, so obviously, uh, in my opinion, there is a correspondence between these two models, and so it's fruitful to make this comparison. After having delineated a um, populationist account, um, a second attempt of my paper was that of trying to apply this populationist view to um, a debate in the philosophy of science. And I choose uh, the theory choice debate. Uh, now, this has been a very um, long-standing uh, debate, very complex. The main opponents were Popper and Kuhn. And um, at that time, uh, they were trying to uh, address questions uh, like the following. Uh, do science execute a sort of algorithm for theory choice when they are choosing between uh, competing theories? Do they abide to the same criteria, for example? How many epistemic criteria there are out there? And is it possible to make a comprehensive list of them? So these were some of the uh, questions of the um, theory choice debate. And now this this allows me to uh, elaborate a little bit further on the relationship between Popper and Kuhn. Um, uh, they had a, a lot of disagreements, obviously, um, but uh, it is important to stress that they both converge on an um, evolutionary view of scientific growth, evolutionary and selective view of science. Um, that was a little bit more developed in Popper, but uh, certainly is very much present in as well. And um, the differences obviously remain. Popper was more convinced that um, um, there was a sort of an algorithm for theory choice. Um, and, you know, there were very specific um, methods, methodolog methodologies, and, 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 and logical procedures that validate science. Uh, he believed also that idiosyncratic factors, such as the particular training received by a scientist, within his community or even sociological factors were largely irrelevant um, because they pertain according to him more to the context of discovery rather than of, of the context of justification. Uh, for Kuhn, um, instead, um, the algorithm for theory choice was not quite attainable idea, as he said, and um, it was, uh, he conceded to, to Popper that, yes, uh, scientists have um, obviously shared criteria, uh, shared epistemic criteria, but at the same time, um, these are used in a far more complex way and far uh, less linear uh, and unanimous way than what Popper uh, thought. Um, and according to Kuhn, idiosyncratic factors uh, are relevant and important. And here is the emphasis on the sociological component of, of science. So for instance, Akun uh, has listed as talk of different epistemic criteria. The classical ones are accuracy, consistency. Consistency, scope of a theory, simplicity, fruitfulness. Um, for Kuhn, um, these criteria are not applied in such a way to detect 
rationally and unanimous choices. What I mean by that? For example, uh, Kuhn pointed out that even two scientists committed to the same list of criteria, they might nevertheless make different evaluations based on those criteria. Conversely, scientists committed to slightly different criteria might adopt the same, the same variant, the same solution, right? For slightly different reasons. Also, he noted that criteria are divided in sub-criteria. For example, Copernicus theory is mathematically simpler than Ptolemy's theory, but the computational effort to calculate the planet's uh, positions are equally demanding in both theories. So the, the question becomes, is it a mathematical or computational simplicity? So there is a, a sub-category sub of, of criteria, right? And which is not clear what is which. In short, Kuhn noted that the epistemic criteria used by different scientists to evaluate a new theory um, were not applied in an, an unanimous and unambiguous way. So the algorithm for theory choice uh, is, according to Kuhn, is not an attainable, quite attainable idea. Clearly states that. In short, uh, Kuhn's view uh, is uh, allows for a variability within scientists' preferences and criteria. Uh, he stresses that this variability is even more prominent during the early phase of development of a, um, of a given theory or a theoretical variant or paradigm. And um, um, later on, when consensus emerges, uh, the variability is broadly reduced. Um, Further, he considers that subjective differences pertaining to biography and personalities are very prominent, particularly in these early stages, and all contribute to generating variability in the operative criteria um, that select uh, one variant or the other. To conclude, um, um, this account allows uh, for uh, variability. Um, account uh, allows for uh, a populationist model um, that has been further developed by um, people like Ptolemy and uh, David Hull. Uh, and this is a far more complex model. What is important here is, is again to stress that variability is present at every level of the evolutionary process, from the individual level um, to the group level. Uh, when a scientific novel novelty is first introduced in a pool of competing alternatives, it is submitted to a range of evaluations uh, that are diverse, uh, and this diversity is reflected uh, by the different backgrounds of each scientist. Uh, they are not univocal, they are not the same criteria, uh, they are not the same epistemic criteria, and this needs to be stressed. This is a, in, in my view, is a sort of a revolutionary view. Uh, to look at uh, the way the science progresses, um, because it's, it goes beyond that sort of uh, obsessions, obsession that many philosophers have to find, um, you know, unique criteria, uh, sufficient criteria um, for, uh, for, for, for example, for, for a variant to be adopted, right? Uh, but here, the, the, the scenario is far more complex. There is an interaction of different um, criteria. Some are um, more closer. Uh, they, they, they go on a spectrum. They range from internal to external, from epistemic to non-epistemic, from content biases to context biases. And they are also a mix, mixture of, 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 of the different uh, you know, components. Um, so it's a far more complex scenario uh, that, uh, you know, requires um, new approaches and requires, uh, um, yeah, maybe the creation of, of new methodologies. And in referring to that, um, I just want to just briefly mention what I think it, uh, are the things this the questions and um, that remain open. Um, certainly, uh, in my opinion, there is um, the necessity to provide a general theory of selection 
um, this uh, I see this as important uh, in reference to some criticism, particularly coming from um, scientists in creativity that they have argued that uh, basically uh, the creative process is not a selective process. Uh, so if we want to defend a sort of Darwinian or um, cultural evolutionary perspective, there is also a selectionist perspective in a way or that allows at least the selections within other non-selective evolutionary forces, but still uh, selective uh, as well. Uh, well, uh, we have to sort of provide a general theory of selection um, that we do not have from, from what I know at the moment. <clears throat> Another problem is a demarcation problem between science and other cultural realms. This has been addressed uh, uh, by also um, Campbell but very, very, very clearly, uh, we have to understand and clarify what is the difference between science and that cultural process. For example, um, how science differs in terms of the epistemic criteria and the selective criteria that determine its evolution from uh, the fashion trends, for example, right? Because we know science progresses, there is a progress in science. So, um, these are even talking about progress. We are, we are, we are talking about normative criteria that are intrinsically normative, and so they are in a way the same. They are already evaluations. So um, it is important to clarify the demarcation between science and other types of cultural evolution. Um, and obviously, how this uh, model and framework eventually applies to, uh, to the study of historical episode of episodes of scientific evolution. Uh, for instance, what kind of methodologies are we need to use? Do we need to use participant of observation derived from cultural anthropologists living with in close contact with scientists and, and creating, uh, you know, sort of ethnographies about their, their activities? Um, uh, other questions are, is it a fruitful theoretical framework? How should we apply it? And does it allow predictions, um, long-term or short-term predictions uh, of historical trends? All these questions are open and uh, um, I leave them to, 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 to you guys and to other researchers uh, uh, to contribute. Thank you so much for listening and uh, I'll leave it to the questions now. Thank you. Thanks so much, everyone. And sorry if it was a little bit long, I believe. How long it was, oh my goodness. <laughs> Thank you very much, Antonio. I think that you asked uh, Thomas to, to be your moderator, right? Or, or did oh, yeah. misunderstand yeah, sure. If there are questions, uh, feel free to, to address them now. I'm, I'm happy to moderate. Yes, please, please. <laughs> Antonio would like that very much. So any, any questions? Uh, Chris, yes. You're muted. Chris, your, your mic is muted. So Antonio, thank you very much yeah. indeed for your presentation. And uh, yeah. I, I appreciated it very much. And uh, I, I have a question which, you know, directly, uh, you know, it, it, it is directly provoked by your last slide. Um, but before I do that, I would like to make one small comment on your first slide, um, <laughs> where you, you kind of give a definition of an epigenetic approach, uh, which you credit to uh, Michael Roos, which I actually think is extremely misleading, his interpretation of the notion of epigenesis. And that relates to uh, uh, our first talk by, uh, by, by Ray and Dennis Noble. Uh, epigenesis, is, as I understand it, uh, is, uh, you know, from my background in developmental psychology, uh, but also from what I have read in developmental biology, uh, is an indeterministic uh, process rather than uh, a, a kind of um, a, a kind of repertoire of uh, determinate possible outcomes. Uh, but um, that that brings me 
actually, because because I think epigenesis relates very much to the the brother's noble uh, presentation. Um, and what I my question to you then it's kind of related to all of this. It is that uh, that you ask how can we actually understand or how can how can this model that you propose or which I take to be the synthesis of the Kuhnian and Popperian model or either of them individually, uh, how can it account for the question that was asked uh, to, to Ray and Dennis, which is why actually do so many biologists resist uh, the kind of program that they uh, are advancing and which is so uh, you know, consistent with uh, other approaches, including, you know, the epigenetic approach, which, uh, yeah, et cetera, et cetera. You know, why, why such resistance? And, 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 you know, does it go beyond uh, just the, you know, uh, the famous quote from Kuhn about, you know, the old paradigm only dies out when its advocates die? Or is there, can your, can your model actually give us more insight into why that should be? That's my question. Mm -hmm. Thank you, thank you for your question. Very, very complicated. Uh, I mean, uh, it's very hard to connect all the dots of, of obviously the, the scenario. But okay, uh, first uh, I want just to specify that the concept of epigenetic rules that was mentioned by rules, the rules uh, mentions, is directly taken by uh, Lumsden and Wilson, a book uh, of 1981, if I'm not wrong, that um, you know, first delineates uh, um, cultural evolutionary models. We are at that time, you know, they were the first cultural evolutionary models um, developed by uh, Cavalli Sforta and, and, and Wilson. Uh, and uh, that's the terminology which is still kind of a little bit strange nowadays because the epigenetic. Uh, uh, program has been developed after that in a way. Um, so uh, it's um, um, so it's not directly referring, it, it, the concept of genetic is more used in a con in, to, to describe culture, to describe cultural, uh, cultural information in a way. So it's kind of a little semantically different than what we, we normally know about epigenetics today. Uh, so that's a necessary clarification. Still, um, um, so uh, and, and that's one. In terms of the um, the how can we? Well, uh, again, uh, this has a lot to do with the, with the understanding of the the method. Your second question, right? How can we explain eventually the resistance of a scientific community uh, in accepting different views? Well. Um, well, the resistance is obviously predict predictable, as I, I just said, David Hall explained very well in his, uh, you know, 1988 uh, Science as a Process. He goes studying uh, two communities of, of systematics and uh, taxonomies that they fight around, uh, um, uh, you know, which, which theoretical framework is, is, uh, is, is the best one. Uh, and uh, he literally, you know, uh, lives with them, he, he goes in their laboratories, he creates like a sort of an ethnography, and that goes to what I was saying. So it's on one side, we have to understand how to really study this resistance, how that happens. And obviously there is a lot of, there is a lot of humanity, you know, David Hall is very clear, there, there is a lot of emotion in, in science, and there is a lot of, uh, um, um, there is a lot, uh, he clearly states that uh, uh, the, the the motivation of 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 uh, and the drive of the of the scientific progress is really uh, you know the 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 the, the 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 desire to defeat the opponent basically. So we have so we have to really understand the sociology of science at this level. Why there is resistance? Why uh, scientists create uh, you know communities that have higher levels of of citations within them because they try, try to cite their friends and so on and so forth. So we have to have that model uh, of, 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 of sociological model to understand conflict and to understand resistance. And obviously if we use uh, the analogy of, of cultural evolution, uh, there are a number of, of processes that can, that can, that can 
um, they can model uh, that resistance. Yeah. So I don't know if it has, you know, obviously it, it's 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 very difficult how this needs to be done to understand how this needs to be done. But there are there are different ways to go. And the first one, in my opinion, is to really try to develop a, a sort of a, a more clear methodologies on how to study scientific communities. Further questions? So as a moderator, I've got the problem that I don't know how much time we have. Um, yes, Dick Payne Wright. Um, I have a comment rather than a question. And that comment is related to the concept of epigenetics. I think the, the person who invented the term was a British biologist, Conrad Body, Conrad Body yeah. yep. in the 1940s. And he linked that term more with Lamarckian type of biology rather than Darwinian. And perhaps the tension between you know, two sides, neo-Darwinism against autopoiesis, et cetera, may be linked to that eventually. And I think there are now biologists who use the term neo-Lamarckian. Mm -hmm. uh, they try to reconcile neo-Lamarckian and neo-Darwinian views, but epigenetics is definitely more within the Lamarckian concept of biology. So maybe something to do with the, with the way how we interpret the evolution of culture as well. So that's my comment. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you for that comment. Very, 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 very uh, crucial. Yeah, it's, it, we have also to uh, keep into account that uh, um, according to cultural evolutionists, uh, they talk of a Darwinian process, but they include Lamarckian uh, evolution. Obviously, culture has Lamarckian uh, uh, properties, right? So, uh, so that Lamarckianism does not uh, undermine the fact that, that uh, um, it is a Darwinian model, according to cultural evolutionists, right? That we are using a Darwinian model. Um, yeah, that's also very important to stress. Okay, I think uh, we have run out of time for questions for this talk. So I probably should uh, hand it back to Natalie for the, introducing the next speaker. Thank you very much, Thomas. And also thank you very much, Antonio, for this very interesting talk. And now we are going over to David Suarez Pascal, who uh, is a professor at the University of Mexico. He has a background in philosophy of uh, science, in biology, and also in computation. And he also uh, does the newsletter for the ESHP SSB, the ISH meeting, which is uh, one of the very important uh, conferences uh, on philosophy of biology. And he's also on the board of uh, the, the series that I uh, edit for Springer Interdisciplinary Evolution Research. And thank you very much for that as well. So David, please. Um, thank you, Natalie. Um, I will show my, my video and share my screen now. Can you see my screen now? Yep. Yes, we can. OK, thank you. Um, um, thank you for inviting me. And, and I am very happy of hearing um, Raymond and, and Dennis and, and Antonio's talks. Um, and my my talk is related to to both of, of of the previous presentations, and it is entitled "Hanson and and Wex School: A Biosemiotic and Evolutionary Account of Theories," um, and it, it tries to, to 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 summarize the content of of the of the paper that I wrote for the special issue on, on evolutionary epistemology, 
which Thomas Hahn presented. Uh, and I, I would talk about a bit about uh, the how how these aut authors, uh, Jacob von Weck School, view on organisms and and a philosopher of science, Norwood Russell Hanson, uh, views on, on theories are related uh, according to, to my own research and about uh, an interesting topic that I, I call physiological interpretation. And I will conclude um, re relating this to evolutionary, evolutionary epistemology of theories. Um, if we think in, in these two fields, the evolutionary epistemology and biosemiotics, we can see that they are two slightly different research programs. One of them, evolutionary epistemology, both of them are naturalistic, um, but evolutionary epistemology has traditionally been related to neo-Darwinism and it, it used to be an adaptationist uh, program. On the other hand, biosemiotics, um, it, 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 it is mostly not uh, construed as an evolutionary program but this is what I am working on, how to connect evolutionism and biosemiotics. Um, regarding their, their conceptions of, of, of how um, organisms and environments are related, evolutionary epistemology is, is adaptationist and biosemiotics is, is more focused on, on the organism. It is, in, in some ways, it, it has um, proposed that organisms build their worlds. Um, also, uh, uh, an additional difference is that evolutionary epistemology is centered on around knowledge, while biosemiotics is centered around meaning. However, I, I try to, to argue that if we, if we look in, in, into the connections between both views, the one of evolutionary epistemology and the one of biosemiotics, we can see that both of them are naturalistic. They don't, don't need to be adaptationist, um, but they, they also don't, don't need to, to neglect a connection between the organism and, and, and reality or, or environment in, in biological terms. And if, if we put together these views, uh, we have this um, this um, framework, which is centered on meaningful knowledge. This is what I, I will try to, to argue for. Uh, first of all, um, what, what is um, Jacob von Weck School's view on organisms? For, for this um, biologist and, and physiologist of of the 19th and 20th century, um, organisms differ regarding the world in which they live. Their umbelt. Also, um, an organism's const construction or, or bow plan defines but what a stimulus is for that being and which its reac reactions are. 
also stimuli and response responses are meaningfully organized for for from web school in order to to explain this um from web school uh, has this notion of functional circle and and he 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 thinks that objects and and subjects objects and and organisms are related to to this kind of um functional or semiotic relationships in in which um organisms um, are are sensitive to to some aspects of objects and they have uh, some particular responses to to that uh, sti stimuli in, in order to to explain this um from web school for example speaks about about ticks and and he 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 says that ticks uh, um are they 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 are free living animals but when when they perceive um a certain an object which is warm and 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 uh, and also detect a butyric acid then they they react and and move toward um, the object which is emitting a uh, heat and and this odor or, or substance this this is the the kind of a functional circle that that ticks have they don't need to know which kind of animal it is if it is um, a cat a dog a deer they are sensitive only to 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 temperature and 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 these mo molecules and and they react in in an adequate way but this is extended by by von Weck school to to every species and and he thinks for example he he says that the a flower stem a flower's stem is related in in different ways to to a cow for a cow for um a cow's umbelt the or or surrounding world would be perhaps a, a, a good translation of umbelt um the flowers stem is food essentially but for for an ant uh, the flower the flowers stem is is uh, is is some a way um to reach uh, the the petals for example or to to move and and on 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 the other hand for a girl the the flowers stem is 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 a way to to hold a flower and and place it on on her hair for instance and von Weck school thinks that these these relationships are 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 established in in physiological terms but are also organized in terms of of their the meaning of of each uh, object or or being for for each species and now i i want to present hanson's view on, on theories mm, for hanson uh, a philosopher of science um, very well known for his concept of, of theory laden observation for him observation and science in general terms are theory laden this means that observation without theory 
it's meaningless. But also, um, it, observation is meaningless without theory because theories enable us to organize or interpret our perceptual experience and make it in intelligible, meaningful. But also because science, science is also theory laden, because embedding theories in, exper in experience enables us to see new phenomena. Um, Hanson's, Hanson um, tells that, that in some way, um, it is thanks to, to our understanding uh, theories that we can see, for instance, um, short circuits uh, occurring or um, that, that an injury is, is contaminated or something like that. Uh, concepts, observations with, which are related to theory become real observations. We, we observe in, in some way the, the kind of entities on things and things about which theories talk. Um, and this means to me that if we analyze Hanson's philosophy, Hanson's view on theories, on theories and science, uh, he is advancing, advancing a semiotic view of, of science. And, and his, his, two, his two more important theses about, about this view of science is the, the first of them, the indis indispensability of theory ladenness in observations. That means for Hanson that theory ladenness plays the ineliminable role of bridges, of, of bridges icons, that is sensorial experience and symbols, language, algebra, algebra etc. Uh, because he thinks that theories uh, and language are essentially symbolic in nature and experience perception is, is iconic. Um, and, and he talks uh, about these two um, to phenomena, uh, seeing something, for instance, seeing um, some light, uh, or for instance, seeing, seeing a pattern in, in a cloud chamber as a, as a particle being emitted um, is conjoined is, uh, uh, with with some expectations, seeing that um, if, we, if, if we place it, for instance, in, in that cloud chamber, some, some kind of, 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 of device, we would get um, a reading about the energy that is it's there released. Um, that is related to, to Peirce's pragmatic maxim, if you know it. And the second uh, semiotic thesis of, of Hanson, according to, to me, is, is this picture theory of theory meaning, which means that for Hanson theories are symbolic, but they become partially iconic by sharing part of their structure with the world. Hmm. I, I think that if, if we put together this Hanson, Hanson's and, and Web School's view, we have this kind of a description of, of this kind of phenomenon, which I, I call physiological interpretations, which is um, a relationship, a bio, biosemiotic relationship, which, which is subject and meaning centered. Um, which exists between environments and organisms, uh, according to, to work school, and between 
reality and scientist, according to, to Hanson. And the, the responses um, of organisms or, or scientists um, by, based on, on this kind of relationship um, are not typically intentional, um, but are rather related to, to internal structures of organisms that is the interior world or in and belt for for web school or to to the theory at a theory is semantics in, in the case of, of, of science for Hanson. Um, what what this means this means that it it is not that I uh, as a biologist um, perceive uh, some colors and, and, and forms, and then I decide to, to see this as a cell or a flower or a chloroplast, but that it means that theories, when, when one is uh, uh, working as a practicing scientist, um, th theories and concepts are embedded in, in my in my in my view in, in my way of, of, of experiencing the world so that I, I I am really seeing chloroplasts or 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 cells or anything and, and something similar happens with organisms for von work school and this kind of relationship is is neither adaptationist um, no representational representationalist. It is rather based on, on a combination of freedom and, and necessity. Why is that? Because it, it is for for from work school, it it really doesn't matter if for instance, um, for for ticks, ticks don't don't need to know very much about about uh, the um, blood, um, warm blood organisms, which which uh, uh, about their hosts. Uh, they only need to to know that there is some object approaching to them, which is uh, warm, and which emits a um, butyric acid or, or, or carbon dioxide and, and, and they move in, in, in the direction of, of this object, which is emitting those signals. And the, the, the only kind of, of um, relationship of matching that is needed to in order for the ticks to survive is, is that the um, ticks actions, the, the direction in which it moves match the direction in which, uh, or the position of the host. That, that is only what is important. And for Hanson, something similar because he, he says uh, theories work like function like maps. Uh, we don't need to 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 know in, in a map. We we don't need to know every where every 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 stone, every tree, every person, uh, every everything is. We in order to use that map, we only need some some traits. We need that. In general terms, the structure of, of the map matches the, the structure of, of the place that we are navigating. Um, what, what is the, the kind of the, of, of the, the way in which um, the, this kind of theories would evolve according to, to, to my paper? Um, 
or what, which are the features of, of this biosemiotic evolutionary epistemology of theories. Mm, the first feature is that theories and organisms are highly conventional, but not entirely constructed. The, 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 their evolution should be linked to, to this correspondence based on, on action, but not so much on, on, on a mirroring of every aspect of, of reality, which has been uh, advanced from a pan-selectionistic or adaptationist view. And finally, uh, um, in terms of how, how, how theories evolve or how organisms in this view evolve, um, it, is, it is clear that chance surely plays an important role in, in, in this evolution of theories or of organisms, but there also has to be a lot of individual and why not collective creativity in, in bringing about new ways of relating to the world based on, on new meanings. At the same time, that actions based on, on those new meanings remain adequate to the surrounding world. Um, I, I think that, that um, it, it might be that, that in, indeed like Dennis and, and Raymond um, the, um, describe it here, um, really chance and, and creativity are, are intermixed and, and creativity can be, individual creativity can be construed or collective creativity can be construed as, as this harnessing of, of chance. But um, it, 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 uh, it might be, I, I, I don't know, I, 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 I am still thinking about what kind of processes um, would be responsible for producing um, this kind of modifications in, in theories and organisms. But, um, but I, I think that this, this view of, of theories is, brings some novelty to, to the evolutionary epistemology of theories. And it, it, it allows us to, to think, for example, about the context of discovery in, in, the, um, in the case of, of the, the evolution of knowledge, the, the, grow, the growth of scientific knowledge. And we don't need to, to continue considering that, that novelty in, 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 in biological and epistemological domains uh, is related to, to blind vari variation. Um, but th there, there seems to be, at least from this theoretical view, uh, a lot more of, of freedom, of, of space for, for contingency and, and, and individual and collective creativity that uh, an extremely selectionist view allows us. Um, and that that is all. Thank you very much. And and please, please um, let me know if you have any any questions. Thank you very much, David. Uh, thank you very much. Are there any questions? I have a question, actually. Antonio, please. Yes. Thank you so much, David. Very interesting presentation. Um, I have some reserves on 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 some some points. Uh, mostly, uh, so um, yeah, you you talk about observation without theory, right? Is meaningless according to Hanson, obviously. Uh, but um, we can think to the field of taxonomy, for instance, right? It, it is uh, it is known that you know taxonomy 
uh, obviously developed from an herbalist tradition back, you know, that goes back to the Middle Ages, basically. And it, it is surprisingly um, interesting to see that, uh, you know, some classifications of, of plants, for instance, are still pretty accurate uh, when compared to, to modern uh, classifications, right? Um, but uh, so if that's true, but at the time, obviously, the, they were done in a totally different framework, right? Theoretical framework, right? We cannot compare the, 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 the medieval, uh, I, don't, I don't even know if they had a theory at all, right? Other than, you know, their the immediate perception. Um, so it is hard to see how this, you, your theory, your framework that you delineated would apply and would be of any use. For example, if we are uh, to explain the history of science, for example, in the, the specific case that I mentioned of the, of the taxonomy, history of taxonomy, right? How would that uh, uh, explain anything? Uh, how would that explain, uh, you know, that today we have a totally different theory compared to the past? Uh, and so, yeah, I'm struggling to see how that could match. Can you um, eventually clarify on that? Do you have any, any thoughts on that? Thank you. Yeah, thank, thank you, Antonio. Yeah, I, I will try. I, I don't know if I understood very well your, your question, but but correct me if I'm, I'm wrong. Um, you are asking me ab about how, for instance, folk, folk taxonomy is related to, to this view of, of theory laziness of, of observation, are you? Mm -hmm. Yes, I'm saying that the folk taxonomy that you mentioned did, that did not have probably a theory uh, but you, according to Hanson's definition, uh, there is always a theory uh, to uh, create oh. observations. Uh, but that does not seem the case yeah. if we look at folk taxonomy because there was not a theoretical framework like the one that we have today, right? Yeah, right? yeah, yeah. But yeah, I, I think that Hanson is not, he's, he's very flexible regarding, regarding theories. Indeed, he, he doesn't, think that that we know very well what a theory is what 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 the the, the nature of, of theories uh, is and and he he would say i i think I, I would say that that there are theories behind behind folk folk taxonomy or natural history but they are not not mathematical or algebraic theories, they, they are intermixed with mythology, with, with theology, but the, the mythology, theology, and, and culture in, in general terms play the, the same role that, that Hanson attributes to theories. In, in this, he, he is, he is part of his, um, is to, is to make this bridge, I think, that he, 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 he understands that, that theories are cultural entities, but uh, they, they are not uh, an entirely uh, culturally constructed, but they need, in order to... to to work for for science or ex experimentation, they need to to match the world the world's structure in in some way, at least partially. But they they always are connected to to their cultures. Okay. Ray, you also Thanks have so a question. Yes, if I may. Um, thank you, David. Very interesting talk. I couldn't help thinking while you were presenting um, of the way in which the chimpanzee's view of its environment is transformed by its utility in relation, for example, to using a stick for a purpose that it may not have used before or a stone for a purpose. And the degree to which this would lead to 
um, abstracted ideas um, about a stone, about tools and so on. A stone as a tool, a, st a stick as a tool, rather than just simply a stick as being a stick, uh, something which it may not have taken much notice of in the environment until it came to that particular problem solving. So that the there is a certainly there a cultural change in the relationship. Cultural change in the relationship. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I thank you, thank you, Ray. Yeah, it is very interesting what you what you ask. What you mentioned because uh, indeed I, I think that th there, there is this naturalistic potential in Hanson's view be because if, if we relate theories with, with actions in, in some way it, it seems that the um, developing new actions is some way of introducing new new concepts, new, new theories, new new meanings. Even even if, if if animals, if organisms are not conscious about those those kinds of of new entities, but, but I think there is um, some kind of evolutionary relationship between our scientific theories and this kind of behaviors that that you are talking about, that you are then start talking about. I, I don't know if I answered your, your point, your question. Um, I have one, uh, again, comment, if I may. Yes, please. If I may. Um, well, um, just one example, perhaps. I'm not sure whether anyone has heard of that. In 2017, the American Association for the Advancement of Science has given an award to what is known the Honeybee Algorithm. So a group of scientists, computer scientists and a cognitive scientist, they didn't know how to resolve the problem of internet traffic until they dis discovered that honeybees do that efficiently with their honey collection methods. Therefore, they borrowed the theory from honeybees. And that was recognized by the Ameri American uh, scientists. So I think uh, what we call theory uh, is quite an anthropocentric concept. I think you school actually that animals have theories. They are obviously not theories in the human sense. Therefore, biosemiotics is, is rather complex. And I wouldn't really go into biosemiotics without Charles Sanders Perth, who was uh, actually doing biosemiotics before you school and Hansen. Therefore, once you include Perth, uh, into uh, biosemiotics, then you may resolve some problems about Yeah, yes, thank you. Sorry? Oh, yeah. Um, yeah, in, indeed. Indeed, uh, Hanson's uh, Hanson's view is, is very influenced by by Peirce, by Charles Sanders Peirce view, and uh, but I, I think that if we if we understand well what, what Hanson tells about theories, um, we can understand what what what. Uh, Pers was saying about about knowledge. Indeed, I, I think that they are telling more or less the same. And and Gwexkul and others, they are more or less contemporary. But they, they, I think this this that they. They converge on 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 the the same 
kind of look that the, I, I found this. I found this very interesting to say the least. Thank you, David. Sí. Thank you, Natalie. Yeah, we're having a little bit of problems ah, with, uh, with, uh, yes, with uh, yes. microphones. So, um, so yeah, it was not entirely clear the last part, but hopefully, okay, we are going to move to the uh, breakout rooms. I'm gonna pass it to you, Natalie. Yes, so um, thank you very much for this meeting. Yes. We're gonna, uh, thank you very much, David, for your very interesting talk. Um, we're going to go to breakout rooms now and we're going to stop uh, filming. But uh, if you want to go to a certain room, like just uh, choose one. There's a lot of uh, echoes now. There's a lot of uh, echoes yeah. now. <laughs> so I'm saying everything twice. But uh, thank you very much. I just want to say uh, the next meeting is uh, on the 19th of uh, March. And then we have David Sloan Wilson and Dean Keith Simonton and JT Velikovsky, who is uh, going to speak. And uh, I want to thank everybody for being here. And bye-bye. Um, so. Uh,